I want to address a common argument I see that if we care about video game preservation, or even media preservation in general, the idea that we should only purchase physical media, and that digital downloads are an affront to the strife for media preservation, and guarantees lost media. I won't deny that there are some points in favour of physical media over digital media, and I won't deny that I still enjoy purchasing and consuming physical media, but to suggest that we should forsake digital media entirely is incredibly fallacious. Digital media can be preserved too, and ultimately it is the future of preservation and the future of sanctioned distribution, whether we like it or not. Quick disclaimer, any mention of legislation in this video is purely my own basic rudimentary understanding, and it's not legal advice. Likewise, any mention of file sharing, private backups, and format shifting are for discussion purposes and I'm not advocating in favour of or against such practices. Lost media is a genuine and real concern, as we've seen it happen to books, films, and music already. Video games are a new medium, and we've already seen some losses there. When it comes to film, music, and books, there's a bit more versatility in how we can distribute and consume than there once was. However, there are problems that still do persist in regards to maintaining and preserving these media. So many different types of multi-purpose devices can replicate these media in digital backup format these days. Your smartphone alone can provide you access to all these content types. It wasn't without controversy that these media forms went digital. At one time, films were pretty much distributed exclusively physically or for cinema viewing, while people outside the market were creating digital solutions for DVD backups so they can enjoy a digital media center set up with a tool like XBMC, rather than having to swap through their DVD collection. It was a case of the industry playing catch-up before we see companies like Netflix come along to provide, well, what once was a convenient option, but that's a whole other discussion. Prior to that, the only cases of film publishers addressing digital media was PSAs against piracy that they were really nice enough to put on people's legitimately purchased DVDs and often were made unskippable. Back before we had services like iTunes, Bandcamp and Spotify, digital music was predominantly ripped from CDs. We then end up seeing them shared on Napster before the music industry sued the crap out of them. As things stand, in regards to UK legislation, copying one's own purchased music CD or video DVD or Blu-ray is not a protected right. There was briefly an exception made in UK law back in 2014, and it was revoked a year later after pushback from the industry. The option for someone to rip their own music CD via Windows Media Player or iTunes is so easy for the typical user, and it's been an option since the days of Windows XP and probably prior to that. These options still do exist, despite it technically being illegal to do this. Likewise, there are a number of tools available for people to rip their own DVDs, Blu-rays, and 4K Blu-rays. I had to look up the legality of media ripping for this video. I grew up in an era where I thought it was okay for me to rip my new Limp Bizkit CD and transfer the files over to my MP3 player that probably had less than a gigabyte of storage. I thought it was okay to rip a DVD and put the film on my PSP. I grew up pre-Spotify and pre-Netflix, so this felt like a typical way to consume media, and compared it to downloading content on peer-to-peer -peer services that I hadn't purchased and figured I was doing the right thing in comparison if I were to take this approach of using my own purchased media. It was just a format shift. Why the hell would I carry around a CD player or a DVD player when I had more portable options at my disposal? You're probably wondering how this fits into games exactly. Well, the closest thing we have to format shifting is emulation. I remember the first time I learned that a soft modded PSP could run emulators. I was incredibly excited at the prospect of taking my Mega Drive collection on the go with me. Likewise, when I learned that some coding wizards at Sony made a PS1 emulator for the PSP and I could put my own games on there, my excitement grew further. It seems pedestrian now when we're seeing a new emulation handheld released practically weekly, and we're starting to see things the size of Game Boys being able to run PlayStation 2 and GameCube games. And we carry phones with these capabilities with us all the time, but in 2005 this was utterly mind-blowing. It soon occurred to me, however, that while I could rip my own PlayStation disc images and format shift them myself, which, at the time, thought put me legally in the clear, when it came to acquiring ROMs of my Mega Drive cartridges, well, a ROM dumper was more bespoke hardware than a PC's optical drive. At that time, it seemed like my only option for portable Mega Drive games outside of those offered on that Sega Mega Drive collection would be to sell the 7Cs. 
The thing is though, as far as industry giants are concerned, this isn't legally okay, and as far as the law is concerned, I'm not exactly in the clear either. Now, when it comes to individual users downloading pirated material, this is something where, anecdotally speaking, and again this isn't advice, I've yet to see action enacted against individual downloaders. At most, I've had someone tell me face to face that their internet service provider gave them a warning in writing about their frequent movie torrent downloads and suggested they might take action such as cancelling their service or slowing it down. Again, anecdotal. I think when it comes to copyright infringement, there are two trains of thought most commonly associated. I didn't realise this was illegal, and I don't care that this is illegal, that's stupid. Copying a DVD, game, or music CD I own into digital form to use on another device I own for private use was something that I didn't realise was copyright infringement. Downloading an illegally shared digital copy of software or media I already own, well, I'm sure a lot of us would say, screw it, you supported the product, just go for it, it's again a format shift. Many people would also advocate for the right to download abandoned media and software, seeing as nobody can capitalise on it anymore, most commonly known as abandonware. And yes, while morally you might consider yourself in the clear, legally it's not a protected right as far as UK law is concerned. Likewise, just outright pirating currently distributed and copyright material is not protected, and to be fair, for most, it seems to be morally questionable, although I'm sure there's a number of bad practice players. The thing is, a lot of these tools to acquire these backtop files are actually legal, it's just how they're used is where the legal line is crossed. So BitTorrents, for instance, most commonly associated with stuff like the Pirate Bay and general piracy, but they're actually legal, well, not the actual pirated content, but BitTorrents in of themselves. You see people use them for Linux distros, and if you were to do a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network with your own content amongst people you know, or whoever else, that's legal as well. It's just taking someone else's copyrighted material over a BitTorrent is illegal. Likewise, if you are someone who made your own like Blu-ray videos or your own games or whatever, and then you were to rip those with whatever software or your own music CD, again, it's legal to use the tools that are available to actually do those. So in a sense, those tools are in the clear. And this is again where emulators come in, because as things stand, they are legal, at least if we're to go with that old Bleem and Kinectix uh, precedent. Um, and again, that's mainly referring to US law. Um, but when you consider as well the industry uses them for retro re-releases, if there was to be a legal precedent put against emulation as a whole, then that could actually be really harmful for a lot of large industry players, especially someone like Sega or Nintendo, for instance, that like to capitalise on their older legacy products. It seems what the industry is fighting is private format shifting and file sharing, and they kind of seem to do it through a two-pronged approach of encryption technology and legal recourse. They want to block user access to the files on their delivery methods, and they want to ensure that we can only use their files in their closed platform, bar some exceptions that I'll get to at the end, and they seem to want to have the backing of the courts to stop us backing up and sharing digital copies of their products, whether they're capitalising on them or not. At the end of the day, preservation isn't profitable, and they've got nothing to gain from keeping these things available for the mass market, or even keeping them just generally anywhere. People are quick to jump to digital media as something that will automatically lead to lost media, while they seem to think that physical media is going to be the saviour of it all. But I would be curious to know how many films, song recordings, and games would be lost to time if we could not digitally record them. How many products that are no longer widely distributed would be available to an audience if there were few copies on the used market? if not for the format shift and file sharing that people have done outside of legislation. Where games have another layer of difficulty over other media forms is how they're so fragmented and technically bound to their software environments. They share traits of both software and media. Much like how work needs to be done to get a Windows program to work on a Mac or Linux, creating a software environment to get code for, say, an NES game to work on another platform like a PC definitely required work as well. The benefit of having hard, read-only copies only goes so far. 
when there's very few of them out there, it gets to a point where it's just a ticking time bomb of lost media in of itself. I get how it can suck if a digital owner game is removed from a service and you can no longer purchase it, but everything gets removed from the market eventually, and the used market isn't exactly the saviour of media preservation that we'd like to think it is. I don't exactly consider it preservation to have to go on eBay to spend about £500 or so on a copy of Panzer Dragoon Saga that may or may not work, depends on media rot, condition of the disc, all that kind of stuff, to then go and play it on original hardware that may or may not need their caps changed and may or may not have a working optical disc drive. And that's the price as well in a day and age where we have optical disc drive emulators digital copies online to download, and reproductions out there, so imagine what that price would be if we didn't have those options available to us. Likewise, think about all of the videotapes that were just kind of lost over time, and no one knows where they are, or has any kind of backup for those, because back then we couldn't back up videotapes the way we have the resources to now, versus how many films digitally we have web rips off that are just all over the internet, and likewise, how many older games that were distributed on, say, Amiga floppy disks or something like that are now lost to time, versus how many games nowadays that were sold digitally, again, are just, you know, backed up across the internet and available because people figure, hey, it's abandoned where, why not? With regard to games, both the industry and community programmers have developed different approaches for bringing legacy content to different newer hardware, like emulation, i.e. creating a virtual environment where the older code is unaltered and the new machine, put reductively, simulates the old machine. Or there's also bespoke ports through a variety of methods like rewriting the source code, creating a new build from the ground up, or decompilation projects. The latter approach, either taking out of community dedication, or in the case of the industry, technical limitations where applicable. For long-term preservation, it's the practice of format shifting, whether industry sanctioned or community developed, that is frankly a necessity for preserving video game media in the long term. Getting a physical copy of an older game is only a small part of the equation to ensuring that that game lasts through time, well, as much time as feasible, really. It's very easy to take for granted that before the days of being able to chuck the whole of the NES library onto an emulation device was just a given, people put work in to decrypt those files, emulate the mappers, the CPU, and other bespoke hardware from the system. People had to work to make ROM dumps too. To consider physical media to be the be-all and end-all preservation is to outright overlook the rest of the process that has gone in by archivists and programmers alike. If not for these resources that people have developed, the resources that Nintendo despises and would like rid of by the way, we'd be limited to older hardware for a lot of these games that's a challenge to run on modern TVs and may or may not be degrading, and are available in limited capacity, as well as physical game cartridges and controllers that are too degrading over time and getting more and more expensive on the used market because, hey, scalpers got a scalp. That's not to suggest that digital games don't require work to decrypt files, code emulators, and make something usable and available, and I get that there's going to be lost media such as the state of mobile phone gaming, but the core reason why we have lost digital media is the same reason that physical media gets lost to time. Decryption changes, anti-format shifting and copying measures, and the same legal strife the industry at large has always taken against consumer ownership of their products and control over how they consume it. In some cases, it actually can be easier to back up digital media than physical media. It's just actually getting that media to run, having the activation key files, or the right emulator or software environment to run it. That's the core challenge, really. But, like, if you take a PlayStation 5 game, for instance, it's a lot easier for somebody to back up the digital files of their installation from their PlayStation 5 to an external hard drive, and then you've basically got a digital copy there. The only thing is, you need a key to activate it, whether it be a disk or whether it be you know, the downloaded uh, activation key if you bought, purchased it digitally. And that's where the decryption challenges come in. It's the same legal strife that the industry at large has taken against consumer ownership of their products and control over how they consume it. When it comes to purchasing media for consumption, 
the whole idea that we don't own it, we just own a license to consume it under the terms of agreements or all that kind of junk, it's nothing new. It's been the case for physical games for all throughout the years, and it will still continue to be. The only thing we technically really own is that piece of plastic. What emulation strives to break down as well is just how readily available video games are for a bunch of different people. Look at how many different devices that books, music, and film can be accessed on. And I'm not just talking about streaming, because we all know how unsafe that is for preservation. But look at how many resources there are for playing stuff like MP4, MP4 and MP3 files, and reading PDFs. Emulators are the only equivalent we have, and they're a constant work in progress, and the industry wants to have control over these tools, and in regards to their distribution, they want to be the sole proprietors. Ultimately, we're just not going to keep games preservation alive by building personal collections of shelves and shelves of physical games, as much as I understand the appeal of it personally. The physical materials associated with physical media just won't last forever. Original hardware won't last forever. We certainly aren't going to stop video games going predominantly digital either. The silent majority aren't people like me or you talking about preservation on YouTube. They're using their money to buy what's convenient for them, as is their right. Being vitriolic towards other consumers for having different purchasing habits isn't going to accomplish anything. I remember a time when PC gamers were labelled by the games industry, games media, and even sub subsets of people within the community as a bunch of pirates who are to blame for damage to the industry, as well as the so-called death of PC gaming. Once again, it just all comes down to product control. The industry saw their games that were on a platform where more and more users were getting access to different tools where they could tweak and change their game experience, and that concerns them, because that control is taken out of their hands. And then that's what led to them scapegoating PC gamers as a bunch of pirates. But hey, guess what? It's one of the most profitable industries there is at the moment. PC gaming is a massive part of video games as a whole. Yes, I'm sure there are some bad practice players out there, but <laughs> you know, they didn't exactly break the market, did they? I also remember a time when the industry and corporate apologists were blaming the sales of youth games for the poor hard done by AAA studios not getting enough money. Oh, what a shame. We ended up getting one-time use codes getting off content that came on the disc. Sometimes we didn't even get the code. Now we're getting games selling millions of copies, but due to poor budgeting and investment decisions, the industry is laying off people en masse. Hell, back in the 90s, the games industry blamed blockbuster rentals for lost sales, leading to games being made harder to finish, often with cheap design implemented due to last-minute mandates by the suits of the respective studios. We need to realise that the game industry's rhetoric, actions and policies are for the most part anti-consumer, scapegoating bullshit. We need to stop blaming each other for their crappy anti-piracy measures that ultimately only harm the experience of the legitimate consumer, and not the pirates. We need to stop blaming each other's purchasing habits for lost media. We need to support organisations that are working to preserve this medium and its arts. For example, if you're in the UK like me, check out the work done by the National Video Game Museum in the link I've left in the description. We also need to show some respect to the work done by archivists, as well as the people documenting these works, such as some of your favourite content creators. One example I want to point to is one of my favourites, Stop Skeletons From Fighting. His work documenting the abundance of abandonware on mobile platforms, and the Zebo, and such, is just so valuable culturally. There's also the people who break down the technical inner workings of games for educational purposes, and just in general we should be commending the work done by people to create tools to help people learn how to build their own games, because I mean, again it's an artistic medium, and in any art, everyone deserves a pen and paper. Also there are so many great indie games out there from either single person developers or small teams who can't afford the cost of print and physical media. Even port into console digitally comes with a cost. Why do you think there's always a stretch goal for Kickstarter games to port to console rather than it just being, you know, a given? If we don't support these kind of works, then that's a damn shame. I mean, if you want to worry about lost media, imagine how many indie works would never exist at all if we never supported them. Imagine how demotivating it would be to future artists if the indie scene didn't get the interest it deserves. Like, triple A's will be fine, as they have a mass appeal. But the enthusiasts like us, who will either ramble on about this stuff, or listen to a numpty like me ramble on about this stuff, are the first people who are going to follow these niche experimental works, and go on to help them thrive through word of mouth. In all fairness as well, we're seeing work done by people in the industry to keep older games alive. 
Good Old Games have done great work in bringing older games to work in order on modern PCs, both in terms of the technical work they've done and the background admin work getting the rights to sell these games, and they do so with DRM-free offline installers. If you want to talk preservation, this is the future of preservation. It's not hoarding loads and loads of discs that have incomplete builds, missing updates and DLC. It's video games free of DRM with the option to allow users to format shift these games and back them up without fear and loss of access once a disc, cartridge or bespoke piece of games hardware eventually ceases to function. For long term preservation, digital media is our most valuable tool and we really need to not lose sight of that. I think in summary, it's worth pointing out that the physical copies of games for legacy content back when they were predominantly distributed physically were important uh, for backing up because then we had something to back up from once the technology caught up to allow us to do that. But I think when it comes to future games going forward, with pretty much all of them releasing digitally as soon as they're out of the gate, apart from those few rare indie games that are being made for older platforms like the Mega Drive, I think quite often it's probably going to be those digital copies that are getting backed up and preserved. And so I think when it comes to the future of preservation, I think it's not going to be as important to have those physical copies to back up and preserve those games anymore with how much change there is in the methods. Hey, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not an archivist or preservationist myself exactly, but... That just seems to be my take on it anyway. Of course, I guess it's important to make a distinction between personal preservation and mass preservation. So, like, if we're looking at being able to play your own collection in the future, then yeah, okay, a physical copy is probably going to be a more safe bet than a digital download relying on a server-based service, but... When it comes to mass preservation long term, I think it's going to be those copies where the DRM is decrypted and uh, that they go around the internet with or without the you know consent of the publishers. I think that's going to be where mass preservation is long term. And yeah, okay, it might not be legitimately legally sanctioned, but ultimately that's just where it is. That's just where we're at. There are resources like Does It Play that will kind of go over different physical releases that are contemporary as to whether they play without updates, online connection, all that kind of stuff. So that can be a useful resource. But the fact that we need a tool like that nowadays to determine whether these physical copies are playable or not, it, I think is a sign of where things are going. I, I think we're going to be getting to the point soon where collecting for new media for new consoles is just not as abundant as it once was i think it's going to be much more of a niche thing and I, even then i don't know how long that's going to last maybe it'll stick around in the lifetimes of us who grew up with physical media as the dominant thing to satisfy us in the same way that newspapers are still around for the older generation even though a lot of people who are younger now get their news online. Who knows? None of us are psychics, so it's just a lot of guessing and a lot of speculation, but that's my take on it anyway. I've That's my opinion on it. I could be right, I could be wrong. At the end of the day, I'm just some random numpty just rambling on the internet. If you have any different thoughts, you know, pop them in the comments. Uh, we'll have a chat about it, as, as long as you're not a dick about it. And yeah, thank you for listening and watching, and um, goodbye.